I'm here with Dr. Kumar Dittal, who's a cardiothoracic transplant surgeon at St. Vincent's Hospital in Sydney. Here, Dr. Dittal and his team have uh, pioneered the world's first donation after circulatory death heart transplant. This has been enabled by the organ care system, which is essentially a machine that the heart is connected up to after it's explanted and perfused with blood, known colloquially as the heart in a box. Not only has this allowed for donation after circulatory death, but it's also allowed for hearts to be transported long distances across the country. Um, across the world, there are only a handful of surgeons that are able to do donation after circulatory death heart transplants, and Dr. Detal is one of them. Thank you very much, Dr. Detal, for doing the interview. So, um, why don't we begin by you telling us a bit about how you procure hearts after circulatory death and the Okay, uh, I guess to start with I should correct you that this wasn't the first time DCD hearts had been utilized for transplantation. The very first heart uh, transplanted by Christian Barnard and those first series in that era were all done with really co-localized recipients and donors on the side by side in adjacent theaters. Uh, but this was the first time um, nearly four years ago that, that we carried out what was a distant procurement of a DCD heart and that inevitably meant you needed a way of transporting it, but also a way of being able to assess functional viability of these hearts. And hence, we combined the, some of the things we've been doing in the laboratory here in terms of cardioplegia supplements of the preservation fluid to try and extend the time within which we could take that heart, but also have a platform on which we could essentially, as I said before, transport and evaluate and almost reanimate and resuscitate the heart. And so the way we go about it is really, the, the technique is a really rapid one. There are two ways of doing this. There is our method, which is a rapid um, explant of the DCD heart onto the, the rig. Um, and the other one is the one that um, Papworth Hospital have, which is a, with sort of in situ uh, extracorporeal support uh, in the donor. And essentially turning that in almost into a brain dead stability and um, allowing you to you know, inside you assess that donor because um, the heart will restart in the circulation and then in a far more controlled way be able to utilize that heart and then again re-implant it on the OCS device, the organ care system for transportation purposes. Now we can't do that in Australia because of the nature of the law is such that we're not allowed to restart the circulation in somebody who's been through the DCD process and so for us there are ethical barriers. Um, and so we have to reanimate it elsewhere. It has been widely accepted. Certainly we haven't had any issues with it. And so it is a really rapid explant, um, necessitated by the fact that these donors will once they become a donor after their circuitry arrest, and with a variable period of what's called a standoff or the waiting period of two to five minutes, that the donor then is transferred very rapidly to theatres. Now that can vary from place to place. So in some places, hospitals, you may be next door in another theater, or you could be in the anesthetic bay, but typically it's an intensive care unit, and therefore a fair distance away from theaters. And that time, we know, is detrimental because it's extending that warm ischemic time when the heart gets even more distended. So when the donor then arrives in theater, there's a very rapid sequence of getting the donor onto the operating table. And we now have it down so within four minutes we can go from chest opening to delivery of cardioplegia. Bearing in mind we also need to take about 1200 to 1500 mils of donor blood to prime the OCS circuit with. And so there's stages in all this that allow you to rapidly do that. And we then tend to take the heart out, leave the lungs inside you so the second surgeon can go and remove the lungs. And it's a method that has allowed us to uh, always use the lung when they're viable, so we've never lost uh, uh, lungs because of our um, uh, program for the DCD heart transplant. And we've always had a program which is protective of the abdominal surgeons, so if their organs are going to be in jeopardy, we would bail out. And we haven't had to do that because the, the way we've worked out this timing just works and we've never had delayed their perfusion of abdominal organs. And then, of course, it means reanimating the heart on the on the device, and then you typically it just starts. You sometimes have to defibrillate it, um, and then we then transport it. And along the way, we assess 
macroscopically how it's sort of working and bearing in mind that it's back to front and it is really in a work it's not in a working mode it's in what's called a resting mode and therefore the aorta is implanted so the blood's actually flowing into the aorta retrograde but obviously integrated into the coronary circulation and it returns the right side of the heart whereby we sew up the IVC sometimes the SVC and that way all that blood goes into the right ventricle and from there there's another cannula that will return that blood into the reservoir. Um, and we're able to assess things so partially physiologically in terms of aortic pressure, coronary flow, um, and as I said before macroscopy looking how it works and you get a better idea of how the RV is doing than the LV because it's empty, there's an LV vent in place. Um, but then we can measure biochemical parameters such as lactate and glucose and we can make those corrections. And, but for the lactate we know from uh, having utilized the OCS now ever since 2006 and the early phases from then on that lactase does have a value um, and, and what we want to see is that the lactate levels are downtrending and being absorbed as opposed to the heart secreting lactate. We are not so fussed about a particular number that you have to get below from experience we realize that as long as it's going in the right direction everything else is good then we would tend to use that heart. Now in the DCD hearts, the starting lactate values are very high because of the distended heart and the fact that there's been no uh, circulatory movement um, and that takes often about two hours before it sort of gets into reasonable levels. Um, so most of our hearts end up being four or five hours on the rig. And not to forget that some of our travel distance in Australia are pretty, pretty far. And um, what are the criteria that you generally use to determine which? Well, uh, the criteria really, the program is recipient protective. We were starting something very new. Um, our experiments in the laboratory had gone sufficiently well enough to try and do this initial pilot study. And we initially felt that every heart transplanted this way would need mechanical support of some sort, I mean, well, ECMO certainly. Um, and that hasn't been the case. In fact, a lot of those. We have had to put ECMO for far more regularly than we would do in our normal brain dead um, uh, cohorts, but um, many haven't. The, the hearts work very well from the word go. So we, in terms of having a recipient protective uh, protocol, uh, went for a sub 40 year old donor with no cardiac history, um, no major trauma, not an excessive amount of inotropes. Um, and that was really pretty much it, because when we look at our brain dead uh, donor cohorts that are below the age of 35, 40, who even come all the way from Perth on a six hour commercial flight sometimes. Um, those hearts will just work. Um, and when they haven't, we've just put them on ECMO and five days later these hearts are absolutely brand normal, you know, working very well. And so that's what we did. And um, now we've extended that to f up to 50. But when you're approaching the 50, we'd rather have a coronary angiogram if possible, which you can't always have. So we have this uh, echocardiogram, which we, we didn't mandate for this 40-year-old or below, and it was lucky if we got one. Um, but now we're trying to be a little bit choosier, um, and hopefully we can extend that a bit more and start becoming more relaxing. Now the Papworth group have extended the age criteria a lot more, um, but we just feel that um, the way ours we, we don't have a way of assessing that heart in situ and we can only do it on the rig when as you can see the difference there's no working modality on it at the moment so there is a greater risk but I think if you have a recipient protective strategy and a little bit more um, or, or less liberal then you do end up having a good and safe program and certainly as, as, as shown by our sort of 2022 20, 20, 20, 23 so far and um, how have you seen your transplantation numbers change since? Um, so we, when we combined initially just the marginal brain dead donor hearts with the DCDs, um, there was almost a 30% increase. So DCDs probably increasing somewhere between 20-25% uh, extra volume for our transplant program. And what inspired you to develop and start this program? All various things, but foremost, I guess um, a, a mentor and a colleague of mine, uh, Stephen Large, who is at Papworth Hospital, and this infectious character, um, who really, you know, wanted to drive this DCD um, transplant. And I, I was there at Papworth with him. We'd be standing outside of Addenbrooke's waiting for a DCDs to occur with permission for research. And, and that led to us at, at one stage being able to put a, a donor who had given permission. Uh, 
on um, ECMO, as it were, on bypass. Um, and the heart, you know, just, just started spontaneously in sinus rhythm. And I realized that this was going to work. This was doable. If we could get the timing right, um, then these hearts, there was no reason why they shouldn't work. And of course, uh, I then ended up coming here um, almost nine years ago now and having utilized uh, the OCS uh, in the UK because they've been using it as part of the phase one early studies of the OCS safety pilot studies in Europe um, and having worked with Steve Large not just in the DCD setting but Steve Large and the group at Papworth were also involved in doing much of the early work of writing up experiences of patients who had had cardiac arrest before and we knew, we knew that these hearts subsequently worked very well once transplanted. So there was all this background that certainly Papworth Hospital was very importantly placed in terms of the evidence that was uh, being gathered. When I came here, um, Peter MacDonald, who's professor of cardiology here, has, has had a very long background in trying to supplement cardioplegia to increase that time, whether it be cold ischemic time, um, certainly out of the body time uh, for these hearts. And so we have gone down the route of combining the addition of post-conditioning agents to our cardioplegia because you can't precondition the, the potential BCD donor. Um, so it's all added to the primary cardioplegia when we first open the chest and we've drained that priming fluid off uh, and then combining with the OCS that I was very familiar with. So for us now, the DCD heart transplants have become standard practice now. It's just we just inform the patients that there are several pools from which the donor heart can come, one being a branded one, and th that those can be standard or marginal. And we also do DCD heart transplants. They've all been aware of, as you, you know, said earlier on, the heart in the box. And they understand that. Um, and um, so it's now, as I say, a very good program. And we're just trying to see how we can improve two things really. One is that in the laboratory trying to expand that time between when the clock starts for that long ischemic period. Um, that, which I didn't mention earlier on, but we had a part of our protocol was to start the clock when the withdrawal took place. Now as you, as you may know you've been on many runs now, but um, the blood pressure doesn't always come down to you know a, a worrying level for a while occasionally and you can have a donor, well a, a patient who can have a reasonable blood pressure for minutes before it then comes down. So we've now gone to the point of utilizing 90 millimeters of mercury as the systolic as a starting point. Mm -hmm. um, and that we think that will buy us extra time in terms of all the ischemic period. Um, and also trying to get to all the various jurisdictions to say whether they couldn't make the location of withdrawal closer to theaters. Um, there are several papers out now that suggest that that is, gives you a far better outcome, even for liver transplantation. Um, yeah, so that's where we're at. So it's, 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 been, it's been a moving feast um, in terms of trying to make it safe, but trying to expand the pool for, we, for whom we can offer this. And typically these are young hearts that would otherwise just have been discarded. It's been really inspiring to hear the journey that um, you and your team have taken to get here. Uh, could you tell us about some of the challenges you face? Yeah, I think there are two the challenges. One challenge is, of course, getting it going and making sure that we stay uh, true to our no jeopardy for other organs um, and that we're always trying to refine those and build a more collegiate atmosphere with the abdominal surgeons, which has happened and they're now you know, real champions for us. Um, but those are those ch clinical challenges trying to make this work for a greater pool of donors. The other challenge is really in the laboratory of trying to get all the background work again to be able to translate into the clinical setting. Um, and finally, probably the biggest challenge, as I see it, is trying to convince others to take this on. And, you know, it's been really wonderful to see Papworth start initially and they're going blazing, so, you know, they're, they're, they're doing way more than us given the higher number of donors of DCDs. There are in the UK and certainly in the um, Netherlands and Belgium. Uh, Harefield and Manchester have started too. Um, we're just waiting for North America and other centers in Europe, uh, and that, that's been a challenge. Thank you. Um, so obviously what you've accomplished is a huge breakthrough in the field of cardiothoracic transplantation. Um, how do you think that this will impact the future of uh, heart and lung transplants? 
Well, not so much lungs in the sense that right now, I mean, as you know, DCD lungs have been going on for many years yeah. and it, it gives phenomenally good results without the use of ex vivo or ex corporeal or ex situ, should be the correct terminology, um, perfusion devices. Um, but for the hearts, it certainly is going to change. I mean, these are really young hearts and we've seen that our results are, if anything, at the end of it, perhaps because it's so protective in a, as a protocol, doing far better in the medium term than our brain dead donor hearts. Um, the other thing is that it really is expanding the volume for us. Now in jurisdictions where the conversion of donation to transplantation is low anyway, because they're not, they're not even using the marginal organs from brain dead donors that we would automatically utilize, then they're better off trying to improve that first. It's still preferable to have a brain dead control setting donor than a DCD donor. And so if you have room to improve in terms of the donors that you could utilize, however marginal they are, um, from the brain dead donor pool, that's what you should do. And then if you still have this big disparity, as I think there will still be a disparity between donors, the availability of donors, and the number that are increasing put on the waiting list, then I think DCD um, donation pool for hearts will become a very valuable resource um, that, as we have shown, uh, can be utilized very effectively uh, for limiting attrition on the waiting list, for limiting the number of emergent LVADs that go into patients on the waiting list, and obviously um, trying to get other people on and get them transplanted quicker. And um, as one of the world's leading uh, cardiothoracic surgeons, do you have any words of advice for a budding cardiothoracic surgeon? Oh, well, don't give up. Don't give up the ambition, that's for sure. If there's always this scary, you know, rumors going around that this is a dying specialty. I think it's anything but. Um, in, in the limited vista of just looking at your own local jurisdiction, you may feel that listen, the number of coronaries are going down and the odd valves going down, but there are many other things going on, and transplantation in particular, and congenital heart surgery, are still going to be expanding fields that are going to be increasing requirements for surgeon who can offer those niche services. If you were to look at um, WHO maps or just look at Africa, Asia, South America, the provision of high-end transplantation um, uh, is, is really lacking. There's hardly anything there. Um, and even rudimentary, just basic cardiothoracic surgery in many parts, if you were to look at you know, almost a billion people in Africa that are without um, and, and many parts of South America. Um, and, and you know in India, despite their enormous population and lots of units, they're still short of services. And I went to see one recently where uh, a previous fellow who's gone and started a service, uh, he's got a beautiful little unit with six ICU beds, and I said, what's your population for this unit? And it was 30 million. So I think we have to have a slightly more global view about it and that you can travel. I've come here, but there's no reason why people can't be traveling everywhere. You just have to be dedicated and do what you enjoy doing and follow, follow your ambition. Thank you very much, Dr. Chital. That was extremely inspiring. You're very welcome.